Well, hey guys, the time has come for us to revisit the topic of fungal acne and fungal acne safe skincare. Fungal acne is not actually the right name for this condition. It's just a popular name that people frequently search out online when they are looking for more information on this condition. The correct name is Pterosperum folliculitis or Malassezia folliculitis. It's not acne, it is a folliculitis. Folliculitis is just the medical term for any skin condition that leads to inflammation around the hair follicle, AKA the pore. Malassezia otherwise known as pterosperum, is a yeast that naturally lives on everyone's skin. However, under certain circumstances, it can cause different skin conditions like dandruff, seborrheic dermatitis, tinea versicolor, head and neck dermatitis. Recently, I did a video all about skin signs of too much yeast, where I go into detail all about these different skin conditions related to malassezia yeast. So check that out if you are coping with these skin conditions, because actually, you know, it's not uncommon for people who have malassezia folliculitis to have some of these other conditions at the same time. For example, about 40% of people with malassezia folliculitis also have seborrheic dermatitis, and about 6% will also have tinea versicolor. Malassezia yeast, naturally lives on everyone's skin and it thrives in oily areas because it breaks down your sebum, which is the oil that is produced in your hair follicle, and that is what it thrives on. And in certain circumstances, the breakdown of that sebum can generate inflammation and some individuals' immune responses are such that they just react negatively to that and lead to malassezia folliculitis. Who gets this? Most commonly, this is observed in people who have weakened immune systems, such as patients who are in the hospital, very, very sick, patients who have HIV, or patients who are taking medications that weaken their immune system, such as those taken for transplant patients, or patients who are taking the medication prednisone, which is a steroid that suppresses your immune system. Rarely, it also can occur in the setting of prolonged use of topical steroid creams and ointments. This yeast loves hot, moist, humid environments, therefore it's very common in tropical settings, especially in individuals who wear really tight clothing, occlusive clothing that can trap that yeast and favor further that hospitable, warm, humid environment for the yeast to go wild within the pore. And people who have hyperhidrosis, which is a medical term for excessive sweating, often can cope with this condition because again, it loves the humidity, it loves the moisture. The other scenario where this can pop up is in individuals who have taken oral antibiotics for a prolonged period of time because oral antibiotics they can kind of mess up your skin microflora and tip things in a direction to favor overgrowth of malassezia within the hair follicle. The layperson's term for this is fungal acne, but like I said, it's not actually acne. It really differs from acne quite a bit. Malassezia folliculitis consists of little red bumps and red pus bumps that overlie a hair follicle because it is within the follicle that this problem is occurring. If you look very closely at them, there'll be a little surrounding rim of redness and sometimes a little bit of scale as well. In contrast to the skin lesions of acne, malassezia folliculitis, the skin spots are relatively all the same size, monomorphic. They tend to be itchy. And in contrast to acne, there are no blackheads and there are no whiteheads with malassezia folliculitis. This is a folliculitis. It is not a problem with pore clogging. It is a problem with inflammation related to malassezia in the pore. So you're not going to see open and closed comedones, aka whiteheads and blackheads. That being said, you definitely can have both acne and malassezia folliculitis at the same time because a lot of patients who have acne, they end up going on prolonged courses of oral antibiotics to help get their acne under control. And as a result, may develop malassezia folliculitis. This is why it is not ideal for people to be on oral antibiotics for their acne for a prolonged period of time. And we really try and limit usage of oral antibiotics and the duration of time that people are on oral antibiotics for their acne, and this is one reason to do so. All right, now that you know a little bit about this condition, it's not acne, it's very different from acne, how can you get rid of it? The number one thing to do to get rid of malassezia folliculitis is to make sure you actually have it. Don't go trying to self-diagnose, don't fall for that. See a board-certified dermatologist, make sure this is what you actually have. A lot of people online convinced they have malassezia folliculitis. They might, but they may not. A lot of things look like this that are not it. For example, you may have a dermatophyte infection in the follicle. You've heard of ringworm? Well, it can affect the hair follicle. Looks much different. You may have rosacea. Kind of can look the same. No comedones, just like 
malassezia folliculitis, or maybe you have acne vulgaris, the formal name for acne. So let's talk about fungal acne safe skincare or malassezia folliculitis safe skincare to be more accurate. Guess what? There is no such thing as fungal acne safe skincare. And what I mean by that is there are no ingredients that feed malassezia. Malassezia thrives in your sebum in a moist, humid environment. There's no ingredient in a product that is going to feed it. So stop reading ingredient lists, trying to avoid certain ingredients. Skincare products don't feed malassezia and they don't drive oil production. Sebum production from your oil gland that the malassezia thrives off of, that is governed by hormones and genetics. Hormonal influences are namely the androgen hormones that we all have, testosterone, uh, as well as insulin-like growth factor. Uh, so check out my video on why your skin is oily. I go into things that trigger oiliness in detail there. So those of you who deal with this condition, check that video out because things that drive oiliness in your body you want to know about because excessive oiliness is going to further support this condition. Controlling the oiliness by modifying things that may be aggravating that for you can help out a lot. But guess what? It's not skincare products. Skincare products don't signal to the sebaceous gland, hey, put out more oil to feed malassezia. They don't do that. There are certain skincare products, however, that can help remove excess oil from the surface of the skin and from within the pore to a certain extent. But the skincare products, they don't influence sebum production directly. Where you can run into problems, however, with your skincare products is more with regards to the consistency, the heaviness of things that you leave on the skin because as I pointed out in other videos, heavy moisturizers, heavy sunscreens, they can slow down the evaporation of sweat. And as a result, your body produces more sweat in the hopes of cooling your body. Because the whole point of making sweat is that it evaporates and cools your body. But if you've got heavy moisturizers, heavy occlusive products on the face, that's gonna slow down the evaporation of sweat. Your body's gonna get warm and your body's gonna try and make more sweat and the malassezia is gonna be like, thank you so much. So while there's no such thing as you know, fungal acne safe, AKA malassezia folliculitis safe ingredients or products, you do want to be mindful of the textures of things and how they feel on your skin. In my videos, I will often advocate as a money saving strategy and a practical strategy in your skincare routine to just try using your body lotion, your body creams on your face, because oftentimes they work. This is a situation where that might not be the right choice for you because body moisturizers in contrast to facial moisturizers are often a lot heavier, a lot thicker, a lot more occlusive, and they can make your face feel a lot warmer and can further aggravate this condition. You can also develop malassezia folliculitis on your body too, so just be mindful of the consistency of products. Likewise, sunscreens that are really greasy and heavy, you may want to back away from and choose more lightweight formulas. Lean into gels, tend to be a lot more lightweight, fast absorbing, allow for good evaporation of sweat so you don't feel overheated, they don't feel greasy, a lot more comfortable on the skin, and will help you in your journey to preventing recurrences of malassezia. In order to get rid of this, the first line treatment is typically some sort of topical antifungal to address the yeast. I have videos all about stuff that you can buy over the counter to tackle this issue. And you'll recall from those videos that anti-dandruff shampoos with the ingredients selenium sulfide, aka selsun blue, or zinc pyrithium, uh, such as what is in head and shoulders shampoo, they can help reduce the amount of malassezia yeast. Now there's an over-the-counter antifungal shampoo called Nizerol shampoo. It has ketoconazole in it. That is another option. Lather to the affected area, leave it on the skin for a few minutes, and then rinse it off. Do that every night for a couple of weeks, and then do it weekly as maintenance. That will help control things. Now, that being said, anti-dandruff shampoos with these ingredients, they can be a little drying, a little irritating. A product that a few years ago I discovered and is actually really good for this condition. Dr. Eddie's Happy Cappy, I think it's called, uh, shampoo for cradle cap. It's it's meant for babies because cradle cap is is another condition caused by the, by the malassezia. It has zinc pyrithione. It's a very mild, mild shampoo for babies 
gentle on the face. So that's one that um, may not be robust for clearing it up, but could be used as maintenance as a face wash. But in some cases you may need a prescription topical antifungal from your doctor if you are dealing with this condition. So that's kind of a first line approach. But if you really think about where malassezia is causing the issue, it's down within the follicle, down within the pore. So accessing it with topicals sometimes can be an issue, especially in certain body sites. You know, this isn't just a facial issue. A lot of people develop it on the back or the chest, especially if you wear, you know, really occlusive clothing, it's sweaty. So it's down in the follicle, right? That means for a lot of people to clear it up, an oral antifungal is needed. That's gonna be um, fluconazole or itraconazole. Um, both can be effective. Unfortunately, with malassezia folliculitis, after you treat it with an antifungal, it'll clear up, but it can often recur, especially if the root cause issues have not been addressed. If you are someone who lives in a hot, humid, tropical environment, try and avoid wearing occlusive clothing. If you are someone who gets this on like your chest, your back, your body, uh, make sure you're wearing lightweight, breathable clothing. Not only is that going to cut down on friction and trapping of sweat and moisture up close to the skin to favor this, but it's also going to keep you from overheating. It'll keep you cooler. Select moisture wicking fabrics. Speaking of hot, humid climates, you may find that you need to dial in the topical anti seborrheic ingredients, the anti-dandruff shampoos, more so in the summer months. Like, you know, I mentioned as maintenance doing the anti-dandruff shampoo treatment to the affected area like once a week to control the condition. But you may need to amp that up more in like the summer months when it's a lot hotter, especially now. Like when I'm filming this video, it is pretty hot outside. That's why in, I'm in Side with the air conditioning blasting. It's actually cold in this room, but outside it is like a sauna. You know, in the more humid, hot summer months, you may need to do this more frequently. Now, one of the root cause issues with malassezia folliculitis is people who have oily skin, excessive sebum production. So again, check out my video on why you have oily skin and I go into some of the nuances of oily skin there and triggers aggravating lifestyle factors for excess sebum production in terms of hormonal influences. Bodybuilders may abuse supplements that actually drive more sebum production. SARMs they're called, selective androgen receptor modulators that can make you oilier. Or testosterone replacement therapy also can make more sebum production, you can see this condition. Alongside acne vulgaris, actually, because acne, you know, both conditions are gonna thrive off of the excessive oiliness. So another treatment that is an option for people who fail these things, have frequent recurrences, is actually um, isotretinoin, aka Accutane. Because isotretinoin is the only therapy that shrinks the oil gland and suppresses sebum production. You know, you have topical retinoids like tretinoin for acne, they don't suppress sebum, so they're not gonna do anything for uh, malassezia folliculitis. But isotretinoin and acne treatment actually can help this condition a lot. Avaclear is a newer acne treatment. It's a laser that targets the sebaceous oil gland and shrinks it. It's pretty effective for acne. Whether or not it will help with malassezia folliculitis by shrinking that oil gland remains to be determined. It hasn't been studied in that regard yet, but it wouldn't surprise me down the road if we don't see this ending up being useful for malassezia folliculitis and other conditions related to seborrhea, aka excessive oiliness. The other treatment modality that can certainly help in some people who have failed all of these other things, have frequent recurrences, is something called photodynamic therapy. I have a few older videos where I'm talking about skin cancer and photodynamic therapy, I think. It's basically a photosensitizing cream that is applied to the skin, and then the skin is exposed to uh, visible light at certain wavelengths and doses, and that actually triggers a cascade that can actually uh, destroy the little malassezia spores and hyphae, helping to cut down on recurrences. And that treatment is also anti-inflammatory. So both those things together can help clear this up and in some cases can buy you a recurrence-free period of time. Although for some people, eventually it still ends up coming back. So the maintenance treatments with the topical anti-dandruff shampoos, antifungals, 
are still needed. All right, you guys, so that's what I wanted to talk about in today's video because I do get a lot of questions um, here on YouTube, over on my Instagram, and over on my TikTok. Please recommend fungal acne safe skincare. So the key take home points that you want to leave this video with are fungal acne is not really the right name for this. It's not acne, it's totally different. It's related to a yeast and skincare products do not feed the yeast. There's no such thing as a fungal acne safe product or a malassezia folliculitis safe or unsafe product. So just keep that in mind. That way you are a smart consumer because there is a market out there of you know products that allege to be fungal acne safe. So let me know in the comments if you have dealt with bouts of malassezia folliculitis this summer because it has been a one hot one, that is for sure. Uh, now on the end slide, I'm going to link that video on signs of too much yeast, aka malassezia. So check that one out next if you are dealing with this because uh, you know I give a lot of information in there that will likewise help you out. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>